uh, Nielsen. Uh, we work in a platform called Answers on Demand. It's a big data reporting platform. Uh, if you guys have any question about Nielsen or our platform, you can you know, reach out to us. I have a question. Do you guys have any open jobs right now? Uh, <laughs> offline. <laughs> offline. <laughs> we do, actually. So we'll, we'll post that up uh, sometime on the meetup group. <coughs> Okay, um, yeah, that sounds nice, you're right in here. Um, so let's get rolling. Oops, can we rearrange this? That's not good. Oh, is this up there? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, uh, so my name is Brett Lindsley, and I work at the Google as a senior architect. I like to talk about data mining tonight. A lot of the presentations um, that I've been working on lately are related to uh, algorithms. Part of the reason is that as people join the Java user groups, one thing they have been interested in have been algorithms. So I decided to present uh, several different algorithms which are very useful in the area of data mining. And I think it's less feedback problems here. So if I do this, okay, let's, let's try this. Okay. That's better. Okay. Okay. So let's do this. Um, so basically, let's talk about uh, the uh, algorithm that I call the a priori algorithm. This is an algorithm that's used for mining data relationships. And if we take a look at this interesting uh, phrase here, on Friday afternoon, ran under the age of 35 by diapers in here. I think we've all seen that comment out there. And when they put the two together, they, they sold zillions of six packs and diapers on Friday afternoons. But the question is, how do you really figure this out? How do you really know that this relationship exists? How do you find this type of thing in the data? How do you know if there's a relationship? So this algorithm is tonight called the a priori algorithm. So what we're going to look at, which will show you how to do this. Um, so by the time everybody leaves within one hour, you're going to know exactly how to do all these different types of things. This is what that algorithm can do. Okay, so like everybody else, I have to do my commercial for where I work. <laughs> I work at Google. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that a Google equipment takes off every 11 seconds. This is a pretty old site. It's probably around every nine seconds now. That's a lot of equipment, a lot of flights that we have equipped. Uh, we're a, a very fast growing company. do a lot of cool things. Um, so I have to tell a little bit about myself. I know about half the audience here, and I know a lot of people from past work experiences. Um, but I'd like to introduce myself to the new folks. Um, currently, I am a senior architect at Google Flight Information Applications. So I deal with a lot of information relating to how flights um, operate. And there's a, a tremendous amount of information, which is a big data problem. <coughs> Previously, a company called Building Works, uh, data scientist, developer, lead architect, software project manager. I did all that stuff, of course, when you're at a startup, one person does a lot of stuff. They don't pay you that much, but uh, at least it's fun doing all the different things. Um, wish I got paid for doing more to find people. Um, previously, I was at Motorola for over 25 years as a uh, distinguished part of the technical staff. There, I got a bunch of patents, publications, uh, software certification, all the stuff that's good for throwing out resumes. Uh, what's interesting, though, relevant to this, oh, okay. what's really interesting to this is some of my background actually is in digital signal processing. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, it was called digital signal processing to process all that information. A lot of the code in your cell phone is stuff I probably worked on 25, 30 years ago, uh, which is really interesting. Um, but back then, it was called signal processing. Now we call this stuff data science. So it's kind of an interesting thing how things just kind of come from a circle. So rather than just talking to your phone and getting a speech signal, now we've got massive amounts of information that we're dealing with. Uh, I also did many previous uh, job user group presentations. Uh, so presentation objectives. What exactly do we want to get out of this presentation? Well, I really want to give a hands-on, intuitive feeling of these under, of the understanding of these algorithms. The reason is, um, you can take a look at all these interesting algorithms, say, I'm going to use that one, I'm going to use that one, but you really have to good understanding what these algorithms do in order to know what you're going to get for a result. So you just can't take a bunch of data, jam it through an algorithm and say, ah, it's done. Uh, you have to know what that algorithm is doing, why it's doing it, because otherwise you don't really know if that result means anything. You get a result, how do you know if it really means anything? Let's really know exactly what the algorithm is trying to do. Um, give, some, give a good handle of what the algorithm can do. Um, understanding that this is really useful for a problem you want to solve. Um, understand some applications. And also, I provide a full working algorithm in Java. So basically, all you have to do is go to GitHub. You can check out a fully operational algorithm that does everything that you're going to see here today. So that's how this is a Java user group related application. Um, OK, so this is not going to be about tools and implementation. We're not going to talk about how you set up you know, clusters or R or application tools. Uh, there's plenty of talks and stuff on that, um, but they don't really teach you what's going on in the algorithms. They basically teach you how to kind of like install tools, how to play with command lines. We're not going to be talking about that today. We're going to focus primarily on understanding the actual uh, operations we need to compute these problems. 
Um, what was interesting is last time I did the presentation on um, the very next day, a very interesting article came up. Uh, Dare your prize, you are your algorithms. Uh, what's interesting is says, big data is not where the value is. The algorithms are the real value. And data is dumb, they, they, they're, they're really going all out. But really, it is the fact of the matter that you can gather all the data you want, but unless you really know what to do with it, unless you can use it to help your business, uh, all that data is really not of much value. It's going to actually do something useful with it. Um, what's interesting is that uh, the word data science is thrown around quite often, data scientist, and uh, just right off of it, indeed, a couple of days ago, it's like, ah, data scientist, this is the leading, oops, leading tech job trend, data scientist, DevOps. Um, what's interesting is you can see there's a nice line going up, so uh, it's a nice term to throw in your resume, it looks good, everybody wants to be a, a data scientist. But let's take it a step further, kind of see exactly what kind of background the stuff that I think we all need to, to have as a, as a good basis to really do these types of problems. Um, actually, how many people here are actually data scientists? Okay, how many are mathematicians? Okay, how about developers and architects? Everybody, okay. Uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, you can all raise your hand for the other two questions as well. And, and in this talk, everybody here will be a data scientist, okay? So, um, what is data science? And this actually was inspired by a particular slide down here. Um, inspired by because it's not exactly what they did, but the idea was to kind of see how the different fields, technical fields, are, are merging together nowadays. Uh, we have software skills, you know, code development architecture, uh, we've got mathematical skills and uh, domain expertise. These things kind of merge in terms of, if you're working in mathematics and algorithm and program, you do numeric analysis, maybe algorithmic research or application development. Uh, data science is kind of like the joining of all these things together. So if you're a developer, you're probably... Do you want to move it down? How's that? Yeah. Still work? No feedback? Yeah. Okay. I'll put the microphone at the floor this time, see what happens. Um, okay, so basically, um, there's a lot of people who are trying to define the term. Um, any, any university will certainly give you an entry course in probability, charge you $10,000 to say it's data science. But realistically, if you take a look at it, people working on algorithmic development stuff, <coughs> people working uh, who have basic mathematical knowledge, um, and some domain expertise, you're basically doing data science work, so I think everybody here at some point is going to be engaging in these types of problems at some point uh, as it works in their career. Okay, so let's take a look now at the a priori algorithm. The primary purpose of this algorithm is to try to pick out unknown interdependencies. In other words, we really don't know what things are related. That's what we want to find. Uh, but we also want to find rules that govern these interactions. And that's actually the more challenging problem because it's kind of hard to determine cause and effect just by looking at a bunch of data. As a matter of fact, uh, that's why I asked the mathematicians here, because if I say cause and effect with correlational data, they'll say, well, you know you can't do that mathematically, so I know I always have somebody call me on that. So we'll get to exactly what that means in a few slides. Um, so let's say we go to a bookstore, and we obviously want to buy a book in data science. First thing we're going to see is stuff like this. Things frequently bought together. I'm sure we've all seen this before. Um, customers who bought this also bought this as well. These are the two things we want to focus on this evening. I'm going to show you how to compute these two types of, uh, types of relationships. Um, and obviously, the idea is to try to sell more stuff, uh, but you have to figure out what the relationships are before you can actually apply this. So we're going to show you how to do this. So the background of this algorithm has been around since <coughs> the early 90s, 1993. Uh, various papers have talked about it. Uh, this is probably the closest or earliest record I could find. Um, this is a very common and valuable algorithm, so it's used quite often. It's a very generic algorithm, and, and you'll see it around a lot. Uh, this is the bottom-up algorithm. It starts out with a bunch of little things and tries to build up these complex relationships. We'll see how that happens. Um, and we saw from the previous slide, we have things like items frequently bought together, and people who bought this also bought that. So these are the two things that we want to try to compute. This is basically a bunch of relationships. This is kind of like a cause and an effect. Uh, so basically, this algorithm is really interesting. It operates on transactions, and that's the, the fundamental purpose of this algorithm. Transactions, the, the most uh, obvious way of looking at this is you go to a grocery store, you buy a bunch of things. Okay, that's a transaction. I go back the next week, I buy a bunch of stuff. That's another transaction. Third time I go to the grocery store, I buy a bunch of stuff. What I buy is considered a transaction. And basically, a person might take a look at my purchase history and say, okay, based on that customer's purchase history, 
What things are related? What are they doing every week? What things kind of make sense? So these are, this is basically the idea of this algorithm, is to take a whole series of these transactions and try to find relationships within them. Okay, applications you're going to see this used for, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, recommenders for uh, buying items, that's obvious. Uh, product placement as well. These are very, very important uses of this. There's a lot of other strange things here. Uh, the autocomplete stuff is typically done through uh, a priori, trying to figure out if I did this, what's most likely am I going to type next? Uh, prime pattern analysis, that's kind of interesting. Try to figure out if there's a pattern in these criminals, uh, this can find this out. Um, there's also forest fire prediction. I thought that was interesting when I read the article. Medical analysis, you know, these people took these drugs, this person had a headache, this person got an uh, upset stomach. If you mine this together, if I take this drug, how often am I going to get that sick? You know, to see if there's drug interaction. So there's a lot of things you can find in these relationships. Um, creating firewall rules, all kinds of interesting things. So now, let's dive into the details. Um, this will get a little mathematical, but I'm trying to demystify the mathematics to give people a good feel for what this is. And if you want, you can go back and dive into all the articles and really look at the details if you wish. Uh, terminology, we're going to need a good understanding of the terminology as we walk forward through this presentation. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. Set of transactions is going to be represented by T throughout this presentation. Again, transactions, I go to a store every week and I buy stuff. That's my list of transactions. Simple as that. Uh, the next set is what's called the item set. Uh, this is, these are the items in the transaction. I go to the store, I buy milk, eggs, and bread. That's my X. I go to the store the next day, I buy you know, eggs and coconuts or whatever. So each time I go to the store, I buy some set of items. This is the item set. So the, we have an item set X, and there's a, a group of transactions, how many times I went to the store and bought stuff. <coughs> now we have another important thing. This is called the support, and this is the proportion of transactions that contain X. This is basically a couple of counters. Now I go to a store 20 times, five times I buy eggs. Okay, so the support is five divided by 20. I go to a store 100 times, 10 times I buy, uh, you know, both um, uh, vegetables and dog food. Okay, so the so, so support is dividing how many times this occurs. So basically this is just a couple of counters. This is effectively our database size. This is how many time, times that particular set of items occurs within that set of transactions. So think about that as a percentage. Of course, if you think about this, percentages also kind of get us into this mode of thinking about probabilities, right? The probabilities are kind of like percentages uh, in, in terms of using the empirical data. We'll see a little bit later that these things are very somewhat related. Um, now here's, we're going to combine these things together. It's what's called a frequent item set, which means I have a bunch of stuff that I purchased. If that occurs with some degree of regularity in the data, we say it's a frequent item set. If, if my frequency, if I want to set that, let's say 40%, then any time I buy something, over a several week period. If I buy that, let's say more than 40% of the time, we say that's a frequent item set. That's something I buy a lot of. So obviously this is a way for us to kind of gauge how important these relationships are. Um, the last thing is an association rule, and it's written like this. If we have Y, then probably Z will happen. Um, what's interesting is the way I phrase it, if we have this, then probably that. So this is basically a probabilistic relationship. Uh, we can't we all know mathematically correlational data cannot give us cause and effect, but it can give us a conditional probability of things happening. We'll, we'll see a little bit more of this in detail. Okay, so you say you want to learn about uh, the prior algorithm, so you go to Wikipedia to look at that. You say, okay, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> uh, well, you know, you can see there's kind of like a uh, K here, there's an L here, there's some big expression that's got K and L baked into it, you got a couple of loops, and somehow it returns something that's got this big U on it. Okay, this is kind of kind of interesting to look at, but if you look, think about it, it's going to be kind of hard to understand what you really do. So let's do something a bit more important. Let's make a flow chart out of this. <laughs> okay. This is really the focus of tonight. Obviously that didn't work. Put yeah. it in my pocket? <laughs> Let me move it down for you. Oh, you can just keep it on the How's this? Yeah, Does this still work? Can yeah. you guys hear? Yeah. I'll just talk a little bit louder, okay? Uh, Okay, so let's convert the algorithm into a flowchart. What we want to do tonight is expand on all these different pieces to see that they're really not that hard to do. Um, we create an initial set of items, and this is a bottom-up algorithm, so most bottom-up algorithms start out with really small things and you build it up to really large things. So we're going to start out with basically each item in the supermarket in its own, as its own item. And then we're going to start building these things up into larger and larger groups. Um, we need to count which pass we are on. So basically, each time we go through the loop, we want to generate larger and larger sets. So that's when we have this, this pass indicator. So now the main algorithm is right here. 
we create our candidates, and we want to create candidates of a specific size according to which pass we are on. We calculate this candidate support. So as I indicated, support tells us how many times does that really occur in the transaction set? What's the percentage? So obviously, if things don't occur very often, they're probably not that relevant. So the next step to do is just say, okay, we're going to prune these things out and just get rid of things that we know are not very relevant. Um, if we prune the list and there's, there's still candidates left, then we're going to go back and say, let's try to generate more of them. So we're going to take our, our current list, start this as our new item list, increment our pass and keep spinning through this loop. So the idea is that we're going to keep on creating candidates, find out how popular they are, prune down the list, and then make another list. So we're just going to keep on spinning until we keep on getting larger and larger relationships. Eventually, we're not going to have any relationships. Um, and this is where we exit. We've got our final list. We exit out here. Um, now what's interesting is that this will give us the relationships, but now we need to do, to do this kind of like cause and effect thing. Uh, if this, then that. So basically, if we have these data relationships, we eventually want to say, well, how are these things doing cause and effect relationships? And this, these are generated from these relationships. So as we go through the presentation this evening, you'll see um, there's going to be several slides <coughs> talking about how this is actually calculated. And once we have all of these relationships, we're going to go through and generate the rules that say which thing came first and which thing came next. OK, so that makes the algorithm in Java a little bit easier to understand. And we can see that uh, this is basically a direct translation. This is right out of the code. Again, the code for doing all this stuff I wrote, and you can download it as you wish. Um, so basically, we have the, uh, the items. We have our loop. We're calculating the candidates, printing the <coughs> list. We finally get done with all the stuff. We generate all the association rules from the actual uh, groupings that we have created. So this is the Java algorithm. And again, you'll see this in the code if you take a look at it. Um, OK, so what I'm going to do is, is show you how the algorithm works on a set of transactions. So this set of transactions was taken out of this reference. And I did this so that you can, if you wish, you can go to that reference and take a look at all the different details. But you can also follow through my code and see how it actually generates what that reference is showing. So this is a, a good reference data set. Um, there's five transactions. The person went to a store five times. Um, we've got A, B, and C. That could be apple, bananas, and cookies. You take your pick, whatever you want that to be. Uh, I went to the store this time bought apple, uh, coconuts, and dog food. So A, B, C, D are just arbitrary things that you purchased at the store. That's all they are. Um, so given the fact I went to the store five times, let's try to answer a couple of questions. Uh, okay, which of these items are related? There's only five transactions. That shouldn't be that hard to figure out, right? But just looking at this, it still really isn't that easy to see exactly how these things are related. And we'll see uh, what this is. If I were to say, what's, what's the most popular relationships? How many? Anybody want to venture a guess? Except for those people who've seen this before. Yeah, it looks pretty popular, doesn't it? Um, so what else do we want to do? We want to see what is the cause and effect within the relationships. Does A cause C? Does C cause A? How do we really know how to figure that out? If I buy this, will I buy that? Or if I buy that, will I buy this? We want to try to figure out exactly what direction these relationships are going. So let's go through and calculate these item sets. First thing we want to do is do this initialization. Um, so if this is a bottom-up algorithm, we start out with each item in its own item set. So therefore, we say, okay, I have A, B, C, and D. I have five different items. Therefore, we got five um, starting points of where these things can be combined together. So again, think of this again as the bottom-up algorithm, starting with all these little pieces, and now we want to start merging these things together. Uh, what's interesting is that if you're to do this with a supermarket, you'll have 42,000 of these things. So your average supermarket, you have 42,000. If you want, you can sit there with a spreadsheet and try to figure out with 42,000 different items and maybe a couple million customers in a week exactly what the relationships are. It's going to be kind of hard to do with a spreadsheet, but you can do this with the a priori algorithm. Okay, so how do we do this? So the first thing we want to do is to join the items with themselves to create larger item lists. Um, this is very simple. We have A, B, C, and D, A, B, C, and D. And basically, we're just cross multiplying these things together. So A can be combined with B, C, D, and E. Uh, B can be combined with B, C, C, and so on. So basically, we're creating all proper uh, pairs of two from the initial pairs of one. That's all we're doing. Uh, so this is basically showing you that we're going to end up with <coughs> n times n times n times 1 divided by 2. So we're going to end up with 10 combinations. So this is basically how many combinations we're going to get. So out of this combination of individual items, we now have a set of items, or there's two items in each set. OK, so now we compute the support. Now, support is how many times does this actually occur in our transaction set? Well, we can go ahead and take a look at all these different transactions over here and say, well, here's AB, for example. 
Uh, this, the algorithm gave me three. You see AB occurs here, AB occurs here, and it occurs here. Now what's interesting is that you can take a look at this and say, well, obviously AB is not probably the largest group because we can see that AB could probably be combined with C there, there, and there. So we can see as the algorithm starts out, it's starting out from the bottom, starting out with these smaller groups, but we want to generate these larger groups over here eventually. Uh, so these are the transactions. Here's what we have for our first pass. So what do we do? Now we prune this out. We say we're going to throw away things that really are not that popular. Um, this is called the support percentage, and here we're picking 40%. So basically anything that occurs less than two times, we're going to throw away. So over here we see that this item occurs only once, so we prune down the list, and here's our next list. So now what do we do? We join all of these together. We just start joining together again. We just repeat this a couple of times. So the next pass, our candidate list becomes the current item set. We increment the size so we know what size we want to try to find. Then we start combining these two item fields to create a three item field. And there's various algorithms for doing this. What's well, interesting, if you start reading all the literature, you'll see all kinds of crazy ways to start creating these subsets. Um, some of them are really strange, so I want to be careful to let everybody know that there's no single unique way of doing this. You may do it depending on how your algorithm works or how your data set is set up. There's various ways to do this. But we can see really what we have to do generically. We have a set of two items here, a set of two items, and we want to have a set of three items. However, if you look at these set of two, what's common between them is one item. So we have one item in common, a length of two producing a length of three. So if you think about that, that's what we want to do mathematically. Uh, there's various ways to do this, but there's uh, also some really interesting tricks in Java you do that make this really easy to do. This one I would say there's various, various algorithms to do this. Anything that produces these types of sets with these types of constraints will probably work. Um, so why is this called the a priori algorithm? Well, the a priori property is that we create new item sets from existing item sets which have some minimum constraint. So this, that's the whole idea of the a priori property of the a priori algorithm. So let's find some more candidates. Um, like this is actually more detailed than what I was just commenting on, but uh, be this being a Java group, let's show you how to do this real easily in Java. So I just discussed that the intersection has to have a specific size, given the size of the actual item sets. Um, and we have to make sure that each of these will differ by just one, that we commented on earlier. And we saw this is yet another example of the intersection is size three, B, C, and D. The sets are size four, and the result is size five. So how do we do that? Well, it's really easy. It turns out in Java, it's only about three lines of code. So again, some of these things may seem mathematically kind of far-fetched. In Java, they're actually quite easy to do. And again, uh, if you look through the code, you see how that works. Um, the basic idea is we compute the intersection quite easily. Um, then we just take a look at the size. If the sizes match up, we have a candidate that we can put into our list. Simple as that. OK, so the candidates pass two. We have these item sets, which are too long. We combine them into sets which are three long. We prune it down, and we now we have our new item sets. And we go through this one more time. <coughs> we have the three. We create item sets which are four long, and we prune these down, and now we have two. So this gets us back into one of the interesting questions I asked earlier. Given that set of five transactions, how many highly popular combinations do we find? Would you have come up with the number of two? If there's only five transactions here, it looks like there's not that much data. But it turns out that these two groupings of items have a popularity of at least 40%. So again, that's what we found by going through this particular algorithm. So we know that these have some degree of popularity within our actual data set. Okay, now that we have these, let's see what we've learned from all this. Actually, the, um, what's interesting is that if we take the next step and say, what happens if we cross this, these with themselves, we're going to end up with a popularity of only one, which means we prune that, there's nothing left. So therefore, we know that the remaining list that we need to work with is this. Our last set of candidates is what we're going to use for our sets. Uh, so basically, to get to that question, items frequently bought together, A, B, C, and D, A, C, D, and E. We, we solve that problem. So if you want to try to figure out which things are commonly purchased together, that's how you do it. It's pretty easy. Um, if you think about this, again, this thing called the support threshold, we know this happens at least 40% of the transactions, which is our support level. So we know. 40% of the time, these things are going to be purchased together. Uh, association rules. This is where things kind of get kind of interesting because now we're trying to determine which of these things are happening first, which of these things are happening second. So let's get some better definitions of exactly what's going on here. Okay, we have an example. Uh, let's say we have a given uh, frequent item set where these many things happen together. So what's the cause and what's the effect? Um, again, 
We know mathematically we can't get cause and effect for correlations, but we're going to, to refine this definition in a moment. Um, let's say we have a frequent item set. Somebody's got some data that says, well, we've got lightning strikes and we've got destroyed homes. Okay? That's what we determined in our first process, which was which things are happening together. But now we want to go to the next step and say, well, what really happened here? Well, there's two possibilities. If there's a strike of lightning, there's some probability of finding a destroyed home. That kind of makes sense. On the other hand, if we have a destroyed home, then that's probably going to cause lightning. But probably not. So it turns out that one of these two is going to have a, a higher probability of happening. So we want to try to figure out which of these two rules really actually makes sense for the data set that we have. Again, think about this. We're going to be dealing all of this with five transactions. Matter of fact, what's interesting is that the example that I'm referring to, they show the five transactions, they show how to create the item sets, but they don't show you how to do this, which is the next step, which is to create all these association rules. So we're taking that example to the next step, and I'm sure you're going to find this quite fascinating, because here's where you're going to find some really interesting relationships that you never would have expected in just five transactions. Okay, so association rules. We want to try to define this a little bit better. We're going to have this general form of y and z. The interpretation is if y occurs, then what's the probability that z will occur? So if you think about this, anybody who likes probability, what does that kind of sound like? Start with a c. Yeah, like a conditional probability. We're saying if this happens as basically some sort of given information as a fact, what's the probability that this is going to occur? So what we're really trying to do is evaluate probabilities. If this happened, what's the probability that that's going to happen? Uh, so basically, we call y the antecedent, and z is the consequence. So we're not going to use cause and effect anymore. We'll use the proper mathematical names so people don't send me nasty messages saying that's what they're really called. Okay. Association rule characteristics. Now, these rules, um, you generate all of them, but there's certain characteristics we can actually glean by looking at the information. Um, one of these is called the rule of confidence. In other words, what we're trying to do is say, what is the goodness of this rule? How do we know how good this rule really is? We just saw that with the item sets. We want to make sure that the item set occurs with some degree, some percentage in the data. That makes perfect sense. Well, effectively, we're going to do the same thing. We want to make sure that this rule occurs with some degree of percentage in the actual data. Uh, this is the goodness of the rule, typically called the confidence. Um, so basically, what we're trying to say is that for a set of transactions that has Y, those transactions also have to contain Z. And if you look at this, this gets back to what we were just commenting on, that this actually can be used as a pro viewed as a conditional probability, where if we're, we are given y, then what's the probability that these, z is going to occur? And again, we can take a look at this as being the probability of finding the right-hand side in the transactions, uh, namely the z as the right-hand side. <coughs> How many of those also contain y, which is the left-hand side? So again, this, this can be related back to the, the concept of conditional probabilities. And we're trying to say this has happened, it's given information, what's the probability of that happening? And it turns out this is actually fairly simple to compute. We talked about this thing called support, which is nothing more than a percentage of transactions. But if you think about it, on the percentage of transactions where both of these things are occurring, what's the probability that this has occurred? So really, it turns out that using this thing called support, which is basically nothing more than a bunch of counters, I have you know, this many counts in my transaction set, I have this many counts in my transaction set, What's the ratio of those two? So really we're trying to find out how probable this rule is. So it turns out that this comp computation, this goodness thing, is actually fairly simple to do. It's just a bunch, a couple of database queries, a couple of count fields, and you got your numbers. So again, um, we want to try to find out how good this rule really is. Now it turns out that that's not the whole story. That's telling us only how often this rule occurs in the data, okay? Now it turns out that rules can occur in the data for many, many strange reasons. So there's another measure we want to look at. This is called the association rule lift. Okay? And what this does, this is the measure of how interesting the rule is. And notice there's some, some interesting ways of using the word right there. Think about it, we're talking about the goodness of a rule and the rule being interesting. Um, so in this situation, what we really want to do is to say how well does this rule provide an association over just random occurrences. Think about it, we don't want to go out and start a business on random occurrences, right? We want to say, does this rule really tell us anything more useful than just random things happening? And you think about this, we're going to do all of this to that five transaction data set in a moment. Uh, so the left, actually, if you think about it, random occurrences is basically, a, uh, we can say, the probability of Y occurring times the probability of Z occurs. It's like throwing two different dice randomly. 
and saying these two things are random events. The probability of these things happening together is basically their product. So that's what this is. But this is important because this basically says what's the probability of this rule actually occurring over just the random occurrence of each of the individual events. So again, we're trying to find some kind of a measure that says, well, these things didn't just happen randomly. There's something going on here. And these are the kind of things you might want to use to help separate out what kind of rules that you're getting. And we'll see in a moment that the popularity of the rule, namely the confidence, uh, will give you some interesting numbers, but the list will give you some other interesting numbers to look at. And we'll, we'll take a look at these numbers in a moment. Um, there's some other additional measures. Obviously, with any type of algorithm, you always got people out there writing plenty of research papers, uh, plenty of people writing PhD topics, and they're going to give you plenty of other things, uh, such as all confidence, collective strength, conviction. Conviction is actually the reverse. It basically says, uh, what's the probability of this rule being wrong when it should not have been, when it came up being right? Or there's just something crazy like that. So uh, I'm sure you can find plenty of interesting mathematical definitions to go experiment on how you want to separate out these rules. But the two that are most important are the confidence on the left. And we can see there's all kinds of crazy things that you can do here. This one I bring up as being interesting too, the Dunning distance. Um, about two years ago, Ted Dunning did a, a presentation. Uh, his presentation was actually on, doing, on detecting anomalous events, but he also talked quite a bit about doing um, different types of correlations and doing uh, predictions and stuff like that uh, in data mining. Uh, obviously, this data distance is, is named after him, and so there's another type of data distance which is also a little bit more interesting, and this is based on a lot of likelihood ratios. So there's some really interesting stuff out there. I'd really like to see them all prepared at some point. So if you're ever bored on a weekend and you want to write a PhD thesis, you know, go ahead and go to it. Um, okay, so rule types. We got all these rules. Okay, what kind of rules are we going to see? This is actually quite interesting. Um, we are looking for useful rules, things that contain some real information, stuff we didn't know about, but there's some good logical explanation for it. Um, obviously, the beer and the diapers together, there's probably a good reason that, you know, gee, I've got to get these diapers real quick, grab a beer, and go out. There, there's probably a good reason for that. These kind of things are useful for business decisions, and this is really what you want to be able to apply to your business. But you have to be careful because these rules might also do something interesting. They might give you something that's called trivial rules. These are things that have real information, but the explanation is probably already known. The information is, is basically can be determined other ways. Uh, there was an interesting paper that I read. They were talking about data mining, saying we want to be able to market these products and take a look at this movie and what's the best movie prediction. And they came to the conclusion that this algorithm performed terribly. They said, gosh, you know, Star Wars 4, A New Hope, is predicting Star Wars 5, The Empire Strikes Back. Well, that's obvious. It's like, well, no kidding. People probably watched all that stuff together. Um, so their definition of what they thought was good was probably not very clearly defined. But this is an example where it's probably pretty obvious that if a person watched the first movie in some trilogy, they're probably going to watch the rest of them. So this type of information is rather trivial. Um, and you have to think about post-processing your data so this stuff doesn't happen. You may want to lump an entire uh, set of movies together, an entire uh, set of a trilogy of movies, into, let's say, the Star Wars movies. And basically then, if a person has any of them, you would basically select as basically only one item, rather than trying to select things that you already know about. So there's, there's several things here that you have to be careful. So again, you have to know a little bit about your data and how the, the information you get back from it in terms of how it's going to relate. Well, that's what's interesting. These are kind of like inexplicable, inexplicable rules. Some of called pathological rules. <laughs> These are things you really can't explain. Like, you, know, you buy more beer when it's a full moon on a Thursday afternoon, well, I mean, who knows? Uh, you may end up with some kind of crazy correlation on that. So you gotta use some common sense. You don't wanna start a billion dollar business on the fact that the phase of the moon somehow affects how much beer I drink. It, it might, I don't know, but uh, you have to think about the fact that uh, you have to have to be some common sense involved in applying this stuff into any real business situation. Uh, at least before you're gonna get the business people to spend a couple million dollars on it. Or a million, who knows? I mean, lottery's up to what now? If I win it, I can spend everything I want. Okay, so now we want to take a look at how we convert these items. We now have groupings of items. We want to now convert these into rules. We see that there's different types of rules. We see that these rules can be um, you know, measured in various ways. So now let's figure, let's figure out how do we actually compute these rules. Okay, so what we're going to do is given an item set, we want to compute what's called a power set. Okay, a power set are all possible combinations that we can find. I'll show you how that works in a moment. <coughs> we want to compute confidence. Well, confidence we've seen before. Confidence is how often does this occur in the data. If it doesn't occur very often, it's probably not very useful. Then we want to prune the list down. Um, typically using confidence, or you may use other types of measures such as the left. So let's go to it. 
Uh, given the item set, we want to find the antecedents and the consequences. So what we want to do is split the item set into all the possible subsets. Um, then we want to say, okay, if we have this thing split up, we're going to just arbitrarily pick one and say, if this is the consequent and this is the antecedent, how popular is this rule? That's basically what we want to do. Now, as an example, if you start splitting this up, let's say A, B, and C is one of the relationships that we have. Okay? So the power set splitting this up says, well, I have A, B, A, C, and B, C. So therefore, we can say, if A and B happen, then what's the probability of C? Again, you can see all three of these values are the same three values of the set. Or we can say, if A happens, what's the probability of B and C? So you see, what we're doing is we're just taking this particular set of relationships and creating all the possible permutations that we can think of and just splitting these into a whole bunch of possible rules like this. So now that we got all these possible rules, now we can start evaluating them and see really how good are they. This is the power set. Now, how we do this? In Java, it's actually really easy to do. Uh, this makes a good interview question. <laughs> Anybody interview with Google lately and have me as your interviewer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but actually, it, it is an interesting problem. Um, again, basically splitting these things up into the sets, it's, it's not a, a mathematical crisis. It's fairly easy to do in Java. just want to point that out. So you'll see this in the code. You can see how it works. Now, <clears throat> let's take a look at what was generated. So again, as I indicated, I took that data set out of the, uh, out of the reference. I generated the, the uh, different types of um, item sets, the, the popular item sets. And again, you'll see that what I have matches the reference. But the reference does not show you how to do this. So this is an extension to it. Well, let's take a look at what that particular five set of transactions is telling us. And this is actually quite interesting. Uh, this is the power set. We split A, B, C, and D into all the different combinations. And you can see there's 13, uh, 14 combinations here. And basically what this is stating, given this confidence, this is 50%. So what it says is that given that C and D occurred, what's the probability that A and B is going to occur? Well, this is going to occur 50% of the time. We take a look at some of these other ones. If I have B and C occurring, what's the probability that D and A are going to occur? And this occurs 67% of the time. So what we can see is that given this particular set, we're suddenly finding all these interesting relationships to say what exactly, uh, how popular are these things in the data set? What's really interesting is this one over here, which is our lift value. It's saying, well, wait a minute. Even though this occurs in the data with this popularity, what's the probability of that occurring just randomly? We don't want to start a business on a random occurrence. We'd like to have some uh, cozy feeling that this is happening for some good reason. So let's take a look at a couple other numbers over here. With this, we have EAC. Whenever we see that in the data set, D is going to occur. That's going to occur 100% of the time. You might say, hey, that's really great. Every time this happens, that's going to happen. So I'm going to go sell this stuff right away. Let's go tell marketing. Uh, same thing can happen down here. I have D, A, E, and A. Every time you see that in the data set, you're going to see C. So again, that occurs 100% of the time in our five transactions. However, over here, this is a little different. They said, well, wait a minute. This is occurring with a lift of 0.2. This is occurring with a lift of 0.25. So what we're seeing is that this is occurring a little bit more often than just random occurrences. So we can say that this rule on top is probably a little bit more valuable from the point of view that even though these happen 100% of the time in the data set, when this happens, it's probably due to something a little bit more than just random probable things occurring. So that's exactly what this particular value is for, this list value. Here's another interesting one. Over here, we have a lift and a confidence, and these values are reversed. Even though this occurs in the data set much less often, it actually has a higher lift to it. So even though this has not happened very often, when it does happen, it's telling you this is probably a little bit more realistic because it's happening more than just random correlations. At some point, of course, you do want to cut this off because obviously if you get down to the point where you're using only a few pieces of data, you're probably <coughs> going to start making a lot of mistakes as your sample size is not very large. So if we take a look at this, we've taken this data set quite a distance. Um, what we can do is take our original transaction list calculate all those rules and just keep those with a fairly high percentage, which is 60% in this example. And then we also want to keep those that are, have a reasonable lift. If you look at this, that re results in this set of uh, rules over here. And you can see some of these have 100% occurrence and some of them have various lifts. So we can say that this occurs 100% of the time, but this one's going to happen a little bit more often or just random occurrences. So basically, you take a look at all these different rules. We generate those rules from those five transactions. So we really beat this data set to death. Out of those five transactions, who would have really guessed that these were all the different relationships that we have? 
Um, who would have really guessed that some of these things are happening more often than just random occurrences? So this algorithm is very powerful. We can actually compute uh, these types of relationships. And it's all based on just these original five transactions. And that's it. So let's wrap this all up. Um, there's a couple of things that we can do to modify this. And with any algorithm, there's always somebody out there modifying it to do something different. Okay, so let's take a look at some things people do. Um, there's what's called a share measure. If I buy one case of beer, is that as important if I buy 10 cases of beer? So I go in and buy my pack of diapers, my pack of beer. Next person comes in, they buy one pack of diapers, 20 packs of beer. Maybe that's more important. So sometimes you might want to filter the actual relationship based on how many uh, of each item that you actually have, and that's called the share measure. There are things called frequent pattern trees, and this is basically a different way to structure all the data so you're not always hitting the database. Um, depending on how you implement it, that's really what you're going to have to take a look at. If you're in a relational database, if you're using a NoSQL database, if everything's in memory, obviously your data is going to be structured differently for each of these situations. This is just a different data structure. Um, and there's plenty of efficiency considerations. But again, uh, we, we don't want to look at that tonight because everybody's implementation could be quite different. Uh, we just want to stick to the algorithm. Uh, so some of the things in terms of summary, um, this algorithm um, will find two things for us, these related items and these association rules. Um, computation is reasonably efficient. Uh, if, it, if you think about it, we're constantly pruning things down to keep the uh, item set at a reasonable size, so it's reasonably efficient. Um, the data, uh, the algorithm is there, so if anybody wants to dig through what it did for the code, all the code that generated all the numbers for tonight's presentation is there. It actually processes on that data set from that particular reference, so you can go ahead and, and dig through it if you wish. Uh, there's some interesting reading out there as well. It turns out there's a lot of tools out there that do different things for you in terms of data mining. And, and this is where I want to say that it's important to understand what these algorithms are doing before you start using some of these tools. It's nice to just say, here's my data set, throw it in the tool. Oh, I'm a data scientist, look what I did. Um, but you know, realistically, you have to have some understanding of what these things are actually doing so you know if the tool gave you a useful result any, at, at the end. Uh, you might get a bunch of stuff coming out and say, wow, this is cool, but if you don't know how to interpret those results or how you got to those results, uh, it may not be that relevant. Yeah? What's the difference between the uh, a priori and the Bayesian one? Yeah, um, so getting to my next week's presentation, I think that's here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so basically there's, again, I, I would like to be presenting some algorithms. I've done a lot of algorithmic work in my past, a lot of data analysis, use a lot of techniques in various situations. Um, so I'm presenting a lot of these algorithms which I think are interesting for doing data mining. Um, and of course, is the a priori algorithm. There's a couple of other things that are actually very useful as well. Bayesian classifiers, k-means clustering is also part. This one here is actually a very, very powerful algorithm that most people know almost nothing at all about. Um, basically, it'll find periodic relationships. Uh, so basically, think about if you're in time and you got little spikes in your data, most regression algorithms don't know that those spikes are irrelevant, so they'll try to fit stuff to them, end up with a bunch of garbage coming out. Uh, this algorithm is kind of interesting. It assumes that anything is a spike is noise and that the end result has to be periodic, so it makes these assumptions of how it works, and it'll generate a periodic model completely free of any spike noise in it. Very powerful. I use this for doing energy analysis at a previous company. So let's answer Scott's question. Um, what's next? Bayesian classifier. Um, in two weeks, I'll be presenting Bayesian classifiers. Um, if we look at what's going on, the a priori algorithm told us what the relationships were. But we didn't know those to begin with. So we started out with just a bunch of data. In the end, we say, here's things that are occurring together. These are related by this cause and this effect. That's what the a priori is doing. Bayesian classifier is a little bit different. The Bayesian classifier is going to say, we already have data and we know exactly which data is correct. We, we already have that. Now we've got this new piece of data. How would you classify it? How exactly would that work? <coughs> the interesting thing about Bayesian classifiers, they are extremely efficient and extremely accurate. I use the word extremely because mathematicians are still trying to figure out why it works so well. Um, but uh, that, we'll cover that next time. So a little bit of a uh, little, uh, interesting topic to look at next time. Uh, so anyway, so this will be an interesting talk. And We'll just kind of wrap up with there are opportunities that go go. You can imagine the aviation business with a lot of data. A uh, system that, that I've been just kept wrapping up working <coughs> will get around 60 gigabytes of data per week. That, that, that's not even everything that we're processing. Um, a little bit on my bio, but uh, we'll leave it at that. Um, okay, so that, that's pretty much everything for tonight. And I hope everybody's uh, pretty much enjoyed this. I thought it's a very interesting algorithm. And again, 
the better you understand these algorithms and what they do, hopefully better you know, ideas you can have for applying this. And when you get results, you kind of understand exactly what, what it really means. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.